Okay. Well, hello everyone. I can see that um, the doors are open to the auditorium and people are coming in. We'll just wait uh, a few moments uh, until uh, everyone is seated, as it were. Matt, I'm going to share the slide. Thank you. Okay, for those of you who are joining us as the doors continue to be open, lovely to have you here. I'm just waiting a few seconds more while um, everyone is seated in the auditorium. With a webinar, of course, it's very hard um, for the rest of you to know who's in the room, but we're delighted today to have a, a range of uh, people with us uh, who, who are about to listen to what's gonna be an amazing talk from our stakeholders, uh, external organizations, through to our PhD researchers, uh, to um, faculty members across our campuses in the university. A, a big welcome to you all. Um, I'm gonna start, the people are still gonna uh, join us. Uh, and I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, who I am. Uh, you can perhaps see my name, I'm Matt Jones. I'm the director of uh, the center here. A center that is really focused on making the world a better place through innovation, disruptive and entrepreneurial innovation of AI and big data. Uh, we care about the world, we wanna change the world and we want to do it in a human centered way. Everything we do is about people, really seeing people as the fundamentally most important technology out there. And then using AI and big data to make them more efficient, more effective, but also more joyful, more successful and more connected. Uh, and that's why I, I am really excited uh, by what we're about to take part in today. Um, I was saying to Anne before uh, we um, opened the doors that I'm a great fan. Uh, there's a brilliant book uh, that you should definitely buy. I don't have commission by the way. Um, uh, and we're gonna hear from Anne uh, in a moment about how to be people-centered, I think, how to be disruptive and how to be entrepreneurial. I'm going to hand over and I'm very pleased also uh, that our Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Paul Boyle, is with us and I'm going to hand over now to the Vice-Chancellor to introduce Anne uh, and then uh, to chair the questions and answers later. For those of you who have questions, I'm sure there'll be many, please type them into the um, chat facility um, on Zoom and then uh, we will use those uh, as part of our question and answer session uh, uh, after the keynote speech. So thank you all very much for coming and over to uh, Professor Paul Boyle. Uh, Prinhan Dharan, good afternoon and, and welcome to you all. Um, I'm very pleased that so many of you have been able to join us today uh, for what of course is our latest event uh, in this international seminar series uh, hosted by the Centre for Doctoral Training here at the University uh, and something that I think has been a real success to date and today is going to be no less of a success, a wonderful speaker here joining us. Uh, we have had fantastic speakers before, but I'm really excited uh, that we've got Anne Bowden here, MBE, who's going to be telling us uh, something about her career, I'm sure. And you will know her as the founder and CEO of Starling Bank, uh, indeed one of the fastest growing banks in the UK at the current time. So a real opportunity to hear not only from an entrepreneur and somebody who's capitalized on building a whole business around a great new idea, but one that's highly relevant, of course, to the work that uh, our students and our staff work on in the Center for Doctoral Training. Um, of course, Anne established Starling Bank uh, in 2014. Uh, it, it's an online bank, uh, and it was designed to make use of technology and think about ways that uh, the world of retail and entertainment had been transformed by that type of technology and how that might then be a uh, used in the banking world. Uh, Anne will tell us much more about this than I can, of course. Uh, Starling has become a major success in the UK uh, uh, with a range of uh, partners and, and businesses and, and customers that it supports. Of course, while the world around us has changed uh, in recent times, we're all still uh, living. We, we, of course, would much rather be with Anne face to face today, um, but we're all working in rather different circumstances through COVID. And of course, it is things like Starling 
that shine through as examples of technology that's been that's able to work in, in this sort of environment as indeed in the normal environment. So it gives us a lot of lessons, I think, about how we might do things differently in the future. Uh, Anne's work, of course, is really about the way technology can disrupt, uh, how it can disrupt, reconnect and change the world, uh, even within a centuries old sector like UK banking. Uh, this speaks to our mission here at Swansea University, our ability to take innovation, use that to disrupt, to change the way we think. And that's going on across all sorts of academic areas, and including, of course, fintech, digital health, even law. So there's plenty of areas where technology can be applied. And I think it's great that we're going to hear from somebody from outside of academia who will tell us a bit about how technology has been applied in her field. Of course, Anne graduated from our university, which I'm very proud to say, uh, as one of our alumni with a degree in computer science and chemistry in the 1980s. Uh, we're extremely proud to count you as one of our alumni, Anne, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back here to Swansea University, sadly virtually, uh, but hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have you here uh, and we will all be able to get together physically. And welcome back, and thank you very much for giving us your time today over to you, the floor is yours, and I'll come back at the end and help chair the questions and answers. And as Matt says, please do put your questions in the chat function and we'll we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Over to you, Anne. Thank you for that very kind introduction, uh, Vice-Chancellor. Um, as a Swansea Jack and an alumna of the university, I am very, very delighted to be here. I actually have goosebumps. It is so, so emotional coming back and, and, and talking to... Um, well, Swansea. One of my earliest photographs of me is a babe in arms of my father as we stood in the Mumbles Road outside the campus. Uh, and he was so proud, like many people from Swansea, of that fantastic campus and this really spectacular vista over the bay. But I'll be talking today about what took me from Swansea University to founding and leading Starling Bank. Uh, technology has always been a part of my life. I love it. Um, ever since I read computer science at Swansea. Um, but in fact, I haven't talked about being a computer scientist most of my career. It was central to my job, but I tried to play it down for some reason. And on reflection, I now understand why. Even on founding Starling in 2014, um, you know, we're now the UK's first fully digital bank. I continue to play down my tech credentials. This occasionally led to quite a few misunderstandings, especially when we were interviewing new recruits. Um, in the old days, we all could cram into one room. You know, when we were about 10, 15 people, we'd be in this sort of very cheap office accommodation and, we, and we'd invite candidates in for, for interviews. And John Mountain, our Chief Information Officer, and Steve Newson, our Chief Technology Officer, would, would interview them. Um, and invariably, I'd walk in as they were discussing some piece of code or very, very techy language, or they'd have a, um, a whiteboard up scribbling on it, talking about some sort of obscure piece of technology. I'd be introduced and I'd be asked if, and I would ask a few questions. And then the interviewee would switch tactics completely and basically resort to very simplistic language, frequently accompanied by lots of exaggerated hand movements for added effect. And I would see John and Steve falling about in the background and I know they were thinking, oh, this is gonna go terribly wrong. I'd wait for my moment and then I'd interrupt with a pointedly technical question. Um, well, basically showing off that I knew what I was talking about because the clear assumption was that if I was the CEO, I couldn't do tech. The obvious question would be, why was I playing down my tech credentials? I suspect that part of it was some subconscious awareness of the still widely held assumption that people in technology roles have no commercial acumen or understanding of business. But this also works vice versa. Being steeped in business is perceived to negate any understanding of technical processes or even a vague interest in technology. For this reason, to establish myself as a CEO of a growing technical bank, I've occasionally needed to subdue my technical background to sell myself as a business person. 
Fortunately, I can now be myself. The tech denial stage is far behind me. The growth of Starling and other neobanks has played a significant role in changing this perception. The reason Starling has become the first mobile bank to become profitable, been voted best British bank three years in a row, and is currently seeing the highest voluntary account switches out of all banks, including our much deeper pocketed high street rivals, is because of its technology. Technology is the center of everything we do, and we're happy to shout about it. Perhaps the most prominent proof of principle for digital banks has been as a result of the global health crisis we've been living through the last 12 months or so. In a short space of time, COVID-19 has accelerated the rate of change in many sectors by 20 years or more. People have easily adapted to working from home and video calls. And in my own sector, cash is no longer king. Individuals who had never been previously considered digital payments are now embracing the possibilities for a cashless society. At any time of great change, a new set of winners always emerges. The pandemic has been challenging on a global level and also for individuals and families. But the clear signs that many of the nation's entrepreneurs have risen to this challenge. We see numerous examples of innovation among Starley's hundreds of thousands of SME customers. Businesses anticipated lifestyle changes as we endured a succession of lockdowns and have prioritized the production of goods for homes, gardens, and home workers. But Starling did have somewhat a head start when it comes to the current challenge. Agility is a key founding principle. Because back in 2014, when we began to develop the app, we were in very much untested waters. We were the first mobile only bank. And while I was fairly convinced about the banking customers really wanted, after a lifetime of hearing what they didn't want, we couldn't really be sure. Most importantly though, we were ready to change and adapt. And our customers love this putting us on the top of customer satisfaction surveys. But as a matter of necessity, all, all entrepreneurial ventures are constantly under review. And that is particularly true of digital ones. It's inevitable that they'll change from where they started on launch day, often markedly. In fact, in the digital world, no company has ever made its name with the exact business model it started out with. Some have changed their strategy so much to be virtually unrecognizable from where they started out. YouTube started as a dating app, Groupon was a charitable platform, and Slack, one of the biggest names in professional chat, was once a video game called Glitch. Starling never needed to do 180 degree change, but the app is very different today from when it started back in the App Store in May 2017. We designed Starling so customers could feed back to us in real time what they did and didn't like, so we could keep testing and retexting and making changes. But there's a skill in understanding feedback and responding to it. If you revise your product in line with every piece of advice you get, and you'll get lots of advice, you may end up with something that appeals to no one at all. As a rule, I hang on until I've heard the same comment at least a few times before examining whether or not it means a change has to be made. But when it came to COVID, we couldn't wait until customers told us what they needed. In the chaos of the early weeks and months, no one really knew. What was most important, that we did something and did it quickly to help our business and personal customers who are very, very unsure and, and nervous about the future. Overnight, we ditched all the projects that we had to do on our to-do list that weren't really relevant to the crisis that has taken place. And we worked through the various pinch points that would slow down operations in these very tough times. On the smallest level, we quickly introduced in-app check deposits and a connected card for caregivers so customers who are sheltering didn't need to leave their homes to pay for groceries. 
We also worked hard at getting our business customers access to vital funds via the government-backed coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, CBALS, and the bounce back loan scheme, BBALS. Now we call, you know, the bounce back loan scheme BBALS at Starling, and then we've noticed everybody else copies us. So it's the BBALS scheme. Uh, we were told about these schemes a matter of days before the launch, and we were able to get them up and running in time. What's more, we set ourselves a challenge that Siebel's and Beeble's processes need to be entirely automated. These are big schemes and it was inevitable there'd be a lot of demand. If a huge degree of human interaction was involved, it would slow processes down to a crawling pace. We didn't want to get caught up in all of that time when customers were understandably so, so stressed. Our priorities would make the process quick, painless, efficient, which is crucial at times like this. Many of our small business customers reported applying for loans and receiving money in their account within two hours. While all this has been going on, Starling has been growing significantly in the past year. Even so, I have focused a great deal of effort on maintaining that startup zeal. Once an organization has reached a certain size, it's very easy to think things are okay and get complacent. Before you know it, things have slowed to a snail's pace. Innovations are a thing of the past and everything is too challenging to be quietly ignored. To keep innovating, you need to find new ways to maintain your appetite for change. So what would my advice to someone planning the next Amazon or Google, Uber, or even a Starling? My starting point would be to think big. By this, don't mean you have to have a big idea. You don't even have to an entirely new idea. If you consider all the giants of today, you probably already know that they were not the first. Facebook was preceded by MySpace. Google was the eighth search engine. Amazon began as a simple bookstore. The difference was they all had a big idea on how it could be done better. Starling was not the first bank. Banks have been around for centuries. What differentiates us is that we are a bank, but better. We have an appetite for constant innovation. But before I discuss why this is so crucial, let me share one of my guilty pleasures. I really enjoy watching adverts for my high street bank rivals or getting a glimpse of banking billboard as I drive by. They make me smile. Why? Because I invariably see them flagging an innovation introduced by Starling months or even years before. In almost every case, the things that the big banks copy are our customer features, such as card controls or gambling blocks, I am hugely proud of these features, but they are a small fraction of the innovations pioneered by Starling. Most of the really exciting stuff you can't even see. When it comes to ambitious changes and that can disrupt an industry, the traditional banks do have it right, at least in part. Whatever the sector, any advances do always begin with a customer. The reason that Apple, Amazon et al are so successful is because they have perfected the delivery of products and services. The entire user experience is seamless. That is what customers want today. It doesn't matter what a business produces, the emphasis needs to be on getting it to the customer in the quickest, simplest, cheapest way possible. We want to be able to log on into our utilities accounts and see the balance we owe alongside a readout of our consumption. When we buy a mobile phone, we expect it to be activated and set up right out of the box. When we plug into the details into the comparison website to get the annual car insurance quote, we'd be very irritated if we had needed to start all over again, inputting our personal details, driving history and spouse's situation. It's all stored there, ready to go. In other words, the product or service is there for the convenience of the customer, not the business. And that is what a bank needs to achieve today. 
Right at the beginning, when I, we were working out these big changes that Starling needed to achieve, I always kept one thing at the front of my mind. It was something that Ben Horovich, the American businessman and high-tech entrepreneur said, new technology is naturally deployed to make something work a lot better. However, in his opinion, to make money out of it, it has to be a magnitude of 10 times better. It's a high bar, but that's what you need to have in your sights. Then once you've got there, you need to think about how to get it 10 times better than that. Starling's now an established mobile bank heading towards our fourth anniversary as an operator. When we launched, there was just one other competitor with a couple more working towards their license. Today, there are dozens of would-be digital banks that are already launching innovative entrepreneurs keen for change. Our established high street rivals now know that copying a few customer friendly features is not enough to stop them losing market share. While a keen appetite for change is crucial, as is a good pipeline of innovation, customer friendly features, there is another important element to stay ahead. Starling can do so much more because our operating costs are a fraction of those of our competitors. This is not just a war of innovation. It's a war of the cost base. To make real meaningful change, one of the most important steps is to forget the old world. Even 2010 is light years away in technology terms. The big advantage of Starling has when it began to build its bank was it was building from scratch. Our own team of very talented engineers sat down and wrote code to build something that no one else in the world had built before. We could take a wholly numerical approach, looking at each process, underpinning the way traditional legacy banks operated and figure out how to optimize delivery of the services customers wanted at a price they could afford. But to put this into perspective, a team of fewer than 30 engineers built Starling Bank. Even today with 2 million current account customers and 300,000 business accounts and deposits of five billion pounds. We still have a team of just 160 engineers. It is easy to see how this puts us at a huge cost advantage compared to larger traditional banks that employ technology departments of tens and tens of thousands. A compact, nimble team is not our only advantage. Established banks needed those large departments because they're layering their new technology on top of existing systems. And then whenever something moves on, they need to build on top of that again. The bit that's on top is only ever as good as the foundations they're standing on. But the alternative is to buy a banking package. They cost billions to install. And they're so, so difficult, it takes say six, seven years. And these projects have a high chance of failure, huge execution risk. Even if big banks are successful in launching digital versions of their products, they will never ever be able to compete against our cost base, nor will they be able to react as quickly as we do in response to the changes in the market. We can induce new features in a matter of days rather than years. Equally important, Starling's business is scalable, which is, or it should be, the holy grail for the entrepreneurial venture, like Google AdWords, Facebook, or Dropbox. We are able to add significantly more customers without proportionally increasing our costs. A scalable business becomes more profitable as it grows. The structure of our business is based on agility, flexibility, and innovation. If we like an idea, we can scale it up quickly and relatively cheaply compared to the competition. But what if the people will make it all happen? There's an incredible talent behind the scenes of Starling. So how do you keep this talent in, on site? As many key followers of the tech knows, culture is a big buzzword. It was Netflix that, flick, that kicked off the current obsession after it published its culture deck online to communicate its cultures to new and current employees. It has since then been viewed by more than 19 million times and Shellen Sandberg once dubbed it probably the most important document to come out of Silicon Valley. 
For a time, no tech business worth his salt would consider operating without a meaningful deck of its own. It was the way to differentiate from competition and recruit the best. In recent years, certainly pre-COVID, the idea behind culture was already showing signs of becoming somewhat watered down. Somehow, a view developed that a warehouse-style office with brick, bare brick walls and a ping-pong table would do. Early on in Stalin's life, I thought a lot about culture. I didn't want it to become superficial, forced or prescriptive. The way I approached it was to think deeply about working practices and how to create an environment where everyone is engaged and everyone can give their best. Making sure everyone feels that a critical part and crucial part of the team working towards a goal is something I've always prioritized. It's an important challenge for any startup where each member of the team is expected to give their all and then some. The challenge is made all the more difficult because any startup will attract a wide range of individuals and a large number of them will have some pretty strong characters, both extroverts and introverts. It makes sense to establish communication channels that take into account all personality types. Introverts need far more time to articulate their thoughts. This is the opposite from the extrovert peers will jump in and share their thoughts straight off the bat. Often introverts feel happier sharing early views by email rather than group setting. Then when they're all ready, they will all speak. Likewise, extroverts should be given the chance to sparkle because they love it. It's worth giving extroverts that face time too so they can express all the interesting stuff that's filling them up with excitement. As Stalin grew, I constantly did my best to promote and support the relaxed and creative culture of a startup, whilst also making sure they had their say and was able to work in the style that suited them best. In the very early days, we had a series of rituals that were part of the effort towards relating to every type of personality of Stalin. The goal was to ensure that we all spent some time together in a relaxed group setting. One of the most important rituals was our Friday morning demos. Each engineer would go up in turn in, and show their app feature he or she had put together. And at the end of each one, there would be a round of applause. As time went on, this developed into a tradition of giving out Starling branded socks. Two pairs for a great demo, which knocked our socks off. One pair for a good demo, pull your socks up. And an odd sock for not so good demo, put your sock in it. What about today? Well, clearly, on hands demos are a thing of the past. Not least, um, in order to preserve our culture and to make every member of our team feel fully engaged as part of something special. This goes especially so for our customer services team who are on the front line speaking with customers in often very difficult circumstances. Many of the customers calling in have been hard hit by the lockdown and are struggling with their finances. While our account holders are a priority, we had to make sure our Starling staff were coping in the most difficult circumstances. By necessity, we have begun an entirely new set of remote rituals. We came up with the idea of Ask Anne, a Zoom session, which we hold at 9.30, uh, twice a week, everyone in the organization is invited both to watch and submit questions and ask absolutely anything they wanted to. We've also launched a series of events called Never Home Alone. These are broadcast on a range of subjects from psychology to mental health to nutrition, all presented by expert guests. Another initiative was to round up all the tech we could find in the office and dispatch it with our team to those struggling um, at home with kids with homeschooling. Staying in touch and maintaining Stalin's culture, as I've discovered, is just the beginning of the challenges in the journey from plucky startup to significant pay player in the banking market. Admittedly, some of those challenges are of my own making. I am, I believe, the only bank CEO who is actually active on Twitter. And by I mean, I am the person who actually handles my own tweets in my own name. I don't have a team looking after at Anne Bowden for me. And this is the plug for you to follow me on Twitter, at Anne Bowden. Um, this does occasionally lead to some most bizarre situations. Perhaps the strangest came, came in the summer of 2019. 
uh, when I got into a very protracted Twitter conversation with a customer and his family who were driving through France towards their holiday villa. Um, for some reason, uh, they'd become convinced that the Starlink card wouldn't work in the telepayage. Uh, you know, that's the motorway toll booth, um, bit like the Southern Bridge crossing. Um, I decided to put it and decided to actually put it on the Twitter community that they, they, they thought it wasn't going to work. When I checked my feed, I saw a lively exchange about whether or not our cards work on the motorway tolls. Um, and of course they do, but this family had convinced themselves they would not. I immediately tapped it out at a reassuring tweet saying, no, this is not true, all will be fine, big mistake. The family switched from tweeting to at, at Stan, Starling Bank to directly to Anne Bowden. Before I knew it, I was talking to them through their first telepayage on a blow by blow basis. Um, and they kept tweeting, we're 10 kilometers away from the toll station. Are you sure it'll work? Yes, I, it'll work, I replied. Well, maybe they'll need to speak to the person in the booth. 10 minutes later, a DM lands. It worked, brilliant, have a lovely holiday, I replied. Half an hour later, we're approaching another one. This looks a bit different. It's a different company. Do you think it'll work? Yes, it will work. Three minutes later, we're through. I tried to picture this family road trip. Two kids patiently sitting in the back of the car whilst their parents had a Twitter conversation with the person who ran their bank. I wonder if they ever thought this was perfectly normal part of a holiday. This is all quite funny, although I had to be sure to screenshot the interaction and send it to customer services. Otherwise, a few weeks later, when something else flares up, the same person would go to customer services and say, well, Anne Bowden herself sorted it out last time. We know her well. We were chatting to her when we were driving through Bordeaux. Surely it can't take you this long to sort something out. I have to be realistic. I have built a brand on the base of being public listening to customers and interacting on Twitter. I can't complain. I have put myself out there. I have made myself available and I have told my story in my book, Banking on It. I can't then put myself in a situation where I announce that I deserve my privacy when it, deserve, when it suits me. Customers love it when they treat, tweet generally about Starling and I pop up and answer a query. It's all part of the branding that Starling is not like other banks, which of course we're not. In the current environment, it is more important than ever that we use all means possible to stay in touch. Most of all, we will continue to use and improve the best tech to make our customers' financial lives better. I am very happy to talk about that. And finally, I think I have one thing to say about my connection with Swansea. I am very, very proud to have gone to Swansea University. I'm very, very proud that I learned my first computer science in Swansea. And that has defined my career. It's been the thread that's given me credibility. It's been the thread that meant that I could have an opinion on things. And that connection with computer science, with technology has meant that I could create a bank, a bank like no other. And I'm so, so proud that you invited me back here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and a uh, fantastic talk. And, and you ended in a, in a very lovely way that I'm sure all of the listeners here, of course, is mostly at least Swansea uh, staff and students, although we do have stakeholders from outside, uh, will of course appreciate it very much indeed. So fantastic talk. And we've already got a, a large number of questions coming in. So I'm going to warn everybody at the beginning, uh, we do only have until five o'clock. Uh, please do keep the questions rolling in and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, and I hope if you if you fail to get your question answered, I apologize for that, but we, we will do our best. Um, if I start, I'm, I'm going to start looking through the chat. So I know that some people have been putting questions in the Q&A as well. Um, and so I'll try and do a little bit of a mixture of both. But if people can use the chat from now on, uh, that's a little bit easier to see. Um, and Matt Jones started off the questions uh, right at the start there. Um, you may or may not be able to see these, Anne, uh, but he's asking about 
Starling obviously practices user-centered or better people-centered design, something mm -hmm. we focus on here in the, in the center, as Matt says. With your huge customer base, what strategies do you deploy to ensure uh, diverse customer voices can be heard in an, in an inclusive way? Mm. Um, nothing like real customers. Um, I think in the early stages of any um, enterprise, um, you try to you try to create um, user groups and feedback groups to model what customers are really telling you. Uh, we don't do that much, and we never really got the hang of it, to be honest. And um, we've always found that real users, real customers, give you much better feedback. Um, I um, we are great users of Slack in the organization. Um, and we are constantly able to see real time uh, what people are saying and what customers are commenting on. Uh, and you, you launch a product, you launch a feature, you put something live, you can actually tell within hours whether that is having the, the right effect. So we do something like five or six releases a day. Uh, we'll know quite quickly if customers are not finding that feature. Uh, we uh, and we can use analytics, app analytics, as well as customer feedback um, through the customer service or uh, people, you know, complaining on social media. Um, it, it's the the traditional methods of you know sitting in a room and watching customers through a glass um, window are just too slow for this day and age. You have to do it real time. Okay, that's that's very helpful. And, and a follow on question, the second question in the list here, uh, pointing out that as Starling grows, maybe it's going to be harder to maintain that culture of openness and, and uh, transparency that you've talked about. How can you make sure that this way of operating continues as it becomes, you know, one of the UK's biggest banks? Yeah, it's very interesting in that we'd got to a size of about a 1000 people. And um, I was really worried that, you know, I, I didn't recognize all the faces any longer and, and it, it was harder to get to all the people. But as soon as we went into lockdown, it's got easier. And this world of virtual world of being able to Zoom or, um, or Teams with people has meant the organization is far easier to reach. And I think none of us realized that it was going to be huge benefits of this world, this virtual world. And I think that we will use some of these techniques, whatever happens in the future. Uh, we have Never Home Alone, um, and we have Ask Anne twice a week, and we are quite connected. I was really worried about having so many people working remotely and whether we'd lose the culture. I don't think we have. A crisis does bring people together and I think that we're in a, in a good position. I don't know how long we managed to keep it at 5,000 people will be, be different, um, probably be different, but perhaps we will be better as well at keeping to the culture. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Jennifer's come in with a question, which is, she's very inspired clearly, uh, particularly about a, a female computer scientist doing great things. Uh, but she does point out that the number of uh, women in, in computer science in Swansea is and has been sometime quite low. What advice do you have to encourage more women uh, to take up what we feel or what Jennifer and, and indeed us all feel is a fantastic subject and hopefully end up being as successful as you? Um, I, I think it's the there weren't many people doing computer science when women doing computer science when I was at Swansea. Uh, when I started my first job, there were hardly any women. Um, I've had my career in finance and tech and now entrepreneurship, and there aren't any women in any of those functions. But the only thing is going to change it is if other women see successful women enjoying it. Um, you know, if we st if we keep thinking of being of computing as being a sub something that boys do or men do, um, but it isn't. It's something that. Um, <sighs> It's a feminine thing. It's a it's a female thing. It's, uh, it's it's not just about gaming. It's about doing things that matter to the world, and I think it's very very appealing for women if it's actually um, characterized as something that's helping the world, that's meaningful, that's about a communication, uh, and we've got to work harder. 
and we got to work harder on having more role models. There are lots of work role models in computing. Um, we just need to see more of them. Great. OK, rather change in tack now. Um, something about regulation and how UK banking reg regulation has either helped or hindered your success. If you could change one thing about UK banking regulation, what would it be? Mm. Well, Starling um, sort of came to life as a result of the regulations changing in um, March 2013, when this two-stage banking license process was um, was was allowed for the first time. Uh, previous to that, you couldn't have a bank unless you had everything in, in, in position. You couldn't have a banking license unless you had everything working and it was signed off. And you couldn't get everything working and signed off unless you had a banking license. So it was catch 21. You, you either had to be a billionaire or a big bank to start a bank. So the laws were changed and that allowed banks such as Starling to come through, and there haven't been that many of them. Um, the regulations are very high. The deposits at Starling are guaranteed by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. And therefore the rules are very, very rigorous and very high. And if you lower those, you don't give consumers protection. Um, so it's not about having less regulation or less rigorous uh, regulation, it's perhaps having different regulation. And, the, uh, and you need to do that a bit at a time. We were the first retail bank to operate in the cloud in Europe. So we, we made that inroad, we made that um, breakthrough. And I think it's quite important now that we start, um, you know, looking at um, the regulations for our sort of bank. Traditionally, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is always almost unheard of for um, a bank to grow as fast as Starling. Uh, and regulators don't particularly expect it to happen. Um, so they're not really prepared for an organization um, that is not an investment bank or not a global bank to have this many consumers, this many businesses. And I think that making sure that we have regulatory regulation fit for purpose and fit for the sort of bank that we are is going to be the next challenge. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, one quick question. Can you re reflect on cyber currencies and, and banking with Star? Yeah, okay. Um, the, we don't particularly spend a lot of time concerning ourselves with um, uh, cryptocurrencies and, uh, and, and Bitcoin. We, we believe that we're focusing on the needs of um, majority of our customers and they don't have these needs at the moment. I think that will change. And I think if you ask me this question in a year's time, um, we will probably have a different answer. Um, the um, crypto is interesting, but it's not our focus at the moment. Okay. All right. Interesting. Uh, interesting to see some big companies in America starting to take more of an interest yeah. in the last couple of days, I think. Uh, so Starling seems to be, this is from Thomas, Starling seems to be one of those rare companies where business interests and user interests align. How do you ensure they remain aligned? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, I think you hire the right people or rather the right people join Starling. There's a, there's a, there's a virtuous circle here where if the organization stands and has a for something and has a purpose, it attracts people who have a purpose to, to do interesting good things. And those people make great decisions and the, and the organization attracts customers who think a certain way. And therefore you attract more people in that mindset. Uh, and we always talk about customers. We don't necessarily talk about profits and Starling. The profits will come when customers love you. Okay, uh, great. And one from Matthew. Who was your most memorable lecturer from computer science in Swansea and why? That's putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, uh, it was um, Steve Jones. Jones, I think it was Jones. And he was the... Um, he was the chairman of the Unix operating system user group. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think I got the right name. <laughs> and that, was his claim, that was his claim to fame. So I, did, I knew an awful lot about Unix operating systems. Okay, great. <laughs> Probably helped an awful lot in designing what you've now designed, of course, in the future. Uh, 
Have you found it difficult? This is from Lydia. Have you found it difficult to maintain your character in a perceived male dominated sector? Um, especially asking if you change at all or not. Yeah, the question is, I think that you do change in, um, your personality changes depending on who you work with. Um, I, I remember when I worked in, in Switzerland for a while, I became very Swiss. I became, you know, I, 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 I absorbed that culture. Uh, the, I've always been Welsh. Um, I've, uh, I've always been sort of proud of where I've come from and my background. Um, and I've always been prepared to say what I thought about things. And some of that time that got me into trouble because junior, if you're in a junior position in an organization, um, people don't necessarily want to hear what you think. Um, but as I've be got, become more senior in organizations, <laughs> it's become more acceptable. <laughs> okay, great. Here's a very direct question uh, from Sanjit Vien. How did you fund the setting up of Starling? Yeah, um, I, well, first of all, um, I, <laughs> yeah, I inherited a house in Calais, which I sold, right? So, you know, Swansea provided the seed funding um, and I, I sort of, I'd been working in the industry for many, many years, so I could afford for a year or two not to take a salary. And I went around the city convincing people um, to do things for nothing for me um, uh, on a contingent fees basis, whereby I would pay them if I ever raised the money. Uh, and I worked on this basis for two years. So for two years, I ran a startup bank without actually having raised any funding until two years in, somebody contacted me and said he'd heard about um, a woman that was hoping to build a bank that it was going to be like no other, based on the best technology in the world, that was going to have a whole new way of sort of relating to customers that was going to be built on data. And I met him, um, met in the Bahamas, and he liked the idea so much that he gave me 48 million to build one of the best banks in the world. Fantastic story. That, that meeting obviously paid off. <laughs> <laughs> And it's in the book. <laughs> and it's in the book as well. So if, yes, everyone must uh, must make sure they buy a copy, and and we have <laughs> copies in the library, or at least they're on their way. Um, so uh, here's another question. Uh, some this is from Nia, I think, came from the Q and A, but been, been copied across. Some early banking innovators, like First Direct, um, had a comparatively low cost base at the time, lack of a branch network, but they appear to have fallen in line with other high street banks, and it's difficult to differentiate between them now. Why do you think they lost momentum? Um, uh, First Direct is actually owned by HSBC, um, and they were a new brand, uh, a flanker brand, basically, from HSBC. So they, um, they were a, a telephone bank, and they developed to about 1.4 million customers, and they never went any, any further because HSBC, the parent, then did telephone banking. Um, and therefore, they were kept on the side as being a... Um, a flanker brand. Flanker brands are brands that 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 are started up to compete with the with the mother company, um, in order to try new technology and um, and compete. And First Direct was HSBC's flanker brand, and like all flanker brands, they never allowed to thrive. Uh, okay, all right, very interesting. Um, uh, we've got another one here from Ossian. Uh, with the recent stock market squeeze in the US on platforms such as Robinhood and the significant loss that many investors have made as a result of stock sharing. Uh, what are your thoughts on the democratization, I think that says, of finance? And how do you think uh, platforms such as Robinhood gamify investments and the ethical consideration of allowing users to make risky uh, positions? Yeah, I, 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 I watch the Robinhood thing with, um, with a lot of interest. Um, the, the great thing was that it, Everybody did hear about it. Um, it was, um, you know, the, their actions or whether they did stop people trading or not. Um, you know, we don't really know. Um, I look. Lots of things start as being um, giving these tools 
and these products to more and more people so that everybody can have a, an equal access to these tools and these platforms. Uh, we just must be very, very careful that they don't turn sour. You know, the internet was all about giving access to um, equal access to lots of people so they could express their opinion. And with fake news and some of the um, sort of horrible things that have been happening recently, that has not been the case. So it's so, so important to look at the moral and the society impact of these new tools, not just um, whether the technology works. Okay, that's uh, that's very helpful, actually. Here's a really nice question. We've got a, this is uh, from Who's Who says, hi, Anne, as a student currently studying a master's in computer science at Swansea University and being a current part-time employee at Starling. Okay. <laughs> I have to say that the culture at Starling is unmatched and very welcoming. Uh, so that's that's great news. <laughs> However, as he now <laughs> year where he needs to apply for graduate roles, he's, he's really asking, are you planning to introduce any graduate schemes? Yeah, we are. It's a question that we we have um, we have a, we have a huge number of people um, joining us through customer service, uh, and many of those people go on to other roles in the organisation. Um, we took on we've taken about a hundred or so people on since the lockdown. Um, yeah, we um, so if people want to apply for jobs at Starling, we don't have a so-called graduate scheme. Uh, but many of the people who currently run Starling joined us as graduates. So they've gone from joining us as a graduate in, in five years ago to being one of the people that sort of run Starling now. Okay. Now I'm going to start picking and choosing a little bit through the questions. Some of them I think do overlap a little bit. So I'm going to pick and choose a bit, partly because we are running short of time. Um, so here's a question from Lydia. Is a cashless society a feasible goal? Is it something you wish to attain? And, and how does this work with inclusivity with potentially older clients that have perhaps are a little bit less tech savvy? Yeah, okay, first, um, yes, cashless society is coming and it's a good thing. And what we have to do is ring everybody with us rather than fend it off. Um, I think we shouldn't assume that um, older people can't use technology. Um, uh, some of the reasons why they can't use technology is because they don't have access to good, good, good broadband and they don't have access to the devices. Those nowadays are the things you need to lead a good life, whether it's for entertainment purposes or for contacting your doctor or for actually having a video conference connection to your health provider. We have to work across industries in the, in the telecom industry, in the um, in big tech and in banking to make sure that everybody has access to these tools. Um, cash is expensive. And I think mm. that we need to um, make sure that um, yes, it'll come. Cash with society will come, but we make sure we take everybody with us. Okay, here's an interesting take from Anna. She says, thank you, it's a great talk. You talked about the importance of innovating new things, and she wonders if you've had any tips for how to stop yourself from becoming comfortable with where, the, where you're at. How do you continually innovate? I think there's a question is once you get bigger and bigger and you don't have to, you don't have to keep pushing yourself to succeed because you, you know, you, the, the, you're already there, then the organization as a whole gets lazy and there's nothing much you can do about it. Um, and you know, when Starling's as big as Google, right, that's when we'll stop, we could get lazy, but we have a long way to go yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, that's a good answer. Uh, here's uh, one of our colleagues from outside the university, I believe, from Jonathan, uh, somebody in the property industry. What are your property requirements as an online bank? Is, is the lack of high street banking sites balanced by a greater requirement for secure servers in purpose-built da data centers? Um, all our all our um, servers are uh, provided um, using cloud technology. Um, so we use um, AWS, we use um, Google Cloud Services and Azure. So we we are we are we we, we use cloud platforms, uh, and we don't have servers in data centers. Um, we operate everything we do um, can operate remotely. However, we have offices in London. Uh, Southampton and of course in Cardiff 
where we have our one of our data science groups. Okay, uh, that's interesting. Here's a, here's a different question. Very, uh, again, another interesting one. Um, this is about Swansea University having a long standing tradition of schools outreach, such as techno camps or further mathematics support programs in Wales. Uh, what role do you think banks should play in, in enriching the school curricula? I think that uh, a number of the traditional banks have been uh, working quite a lot in actually trying to educate and sort of involve all parts of society in, in, in financial education. Um, what can Starling do? Um, I think that uh, what we are trying to do is, is in a structured way, take on things we can achieve. We're only 1,100 people. Um, we're only sort of, sort of, we're quite new. Um, uh, but what we do tend to do is take on one problem at a time. And the problem we're trying to solve at the moment is make money equal. Um, hashtag make money equal. This is our campaign to influence the media to talk to men and women equally about money. And if you look at the way the press talks to women about money, it's all about scrimping and saving and not spending on shoes. And if you talk to um, the me, if you go through the articles about men and money, it's all about power suits and crypto. So you know, let's let's get a an, um, let's lobby the press to be fair when they talk to women about money. Okay. Here's a shorter question. I see Alex put up quite a long question, so I'm, I'm afraid, Alex, I'm going to skip that given time. Uh, here's a shorter one. I was wondering what benefits you were offering originally to get people to sign up and trust to share their data. Uh, would you say paying for advertisements was necessary? Uh, we didn't spend much money on any advertisements for years. Um, uh, people, initially, it was all about um, enthusing people. Uh, it was trying to use individual contacts. Um, I remember that one weekend I sent out a, an email to 10,000 people I knew at LinkedIn. Uh, another, another day, I, <clears throat> I literally went with a group of people from office to office in the city, giving away ice creams in order to tempt them to open an account. In the early days, you do things that don't scale, right? And that is how you get... Um, and, you, and you can do it because you have a very, very personal way of persuading people to open an account and you get lots of feedback. Um, you, you know, sort of people will say you can't do every account like that, Anne, but you can do the first few. And that's the important thing. OK, so Alex has said it's fine to ask just the first part of his question. So I'll go back to that uh, in, in trying to create a bank that can develop both the technical side of innovation, but also the social side. And in doing so, trying to bridge the gap between the service and customer, what would you say is the most important way that you've been able to support people in recent times? And as a follow-up, what's the biggest way you, you want to help support people in the future? Mm. I, think, I say this quite a lot, it's about being relevant. It's all about being totally realistic on the problems you can solve and looking six weeks ahead in what you can do. Um, the plans that extend years into the future, um, plans to solve social issues that are out of reach are not practical. Starling is about doing things we can do and making our small contribution to making finance better for people. Great. And one last question, because I think it's fun. On a lighter note, uh, why did you name your bank Starling? Why not Robin or Sparrow, for example? <laughs> Well, Starling, um, Starling is a is a bird that um, basically is very collegiate. They're very well coordinated. It's not just one Starling; it's a group of them. Uh, they do things in a very elegant way together, um, and they occasionally sort of um, swarm in there and knock the incumbents off the perch. Um, so that's why Starling. <laughs> great. So, so obviously, a lot of thought went into that. <laughs> And that was a great talk and, and not only a great talk, but you answered the questions really well, I, I thought, very honestly, but not just honestly, but, you know, really transparently. You really un helped, I think, people understand exactly what your thinking is around this, um, this organisation and how you've developed it from scratch. I'm going to hand back now to Matt. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed it very, very much, as I'm sure all of our guests here today have done as well. But I'll hand back to Matt just to finish off for us. Yeah, th thank you, Vice-Chancellor. And 
Thank you so much, uh, Anne. Um, as somebody who is um, profoundly also proud of Swansea University and also profoundly sure that Swansea University makes a huge difference, it was just really touching to hear what you said about your time with us. And I, I can tell you that we're still the same. We are a, a university that is focused on doing good for people and with people. Uh, and, uh, and as Paul said, we'd just be so delighted to, to welcome you here physically to see what's changed. And hopefully you'll see the spirit that has stayed the same. Thank you very much indeed. Also, thank you to you, Paul, for, for chairing. Tashi and Alex, who are not visible at the moment, they did a lot of work to uh, make this happen. So thank you, Alex, and thank you, Tashi. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, today. I'm sure it's inspired you. We'll be carrying on with the series. Um, I think next week we've got the father of the internet, who is Vint Cerf. So, um, well, uh, and without Vint, there wouldn't have been Starling. And without you, there won't be a lot of other types of infrastructure. Look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week. And again, thank you so much, Anne, and great success and see you here soon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, Anne. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Bye bye for now.